Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Xu Xiaoling, uh, Lin Tui Juan. I'm from National Chengdu University, Associate Professor of the College of Communication, Zhengda uh, Guangdian Xifu Jiaoshou. It's my great pleasure to chair and moderate this session because uh, personally, my research interests also focusing on new media and the social impact. And today, I think the session is very, very meaningful because all of us wanted to chasing the truth, right? But it's getting more and more difficult because we are situated in the age of misinformation and uh, there's also some technological gaps. But today, we have three international experts. They try to, you know, they try their best to use different civic media and the platforms to solve the very important social and civil issues. And the first presenter will be Miss Deborah Abu. And she is from uh, Brazil, and uh, she currently works as a researcher uh, for the Institute for Technology and Society of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And she flew like 30 hours here to Taipei. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> <laughs> So she's going to really share a very exciting topic, particularly I'm also very interested, because we get some manipulation from social media. We have bots. Can bots actually influence our online opinions? I think the uh, answer is yes. But how can we actually prevent such a negative impact and make sure all the bots, all the te uh, technological manipulation won't influence our democracy, election, and our civic opinions. Without further ado, let's welcome Deborah to share. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, or ni hao, which is one of the only two expressions that I know in Chinese, unfortunately, but I think they're the most important ones. It's the ni hao and the xie xie. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tricia, for this presentation. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the whole team of GovZero Summit. Uh, it's amazing what you guys have been doing here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, to come from Brazil, to share with you a little bit about um, our experiences there and what have we been learning so far. Uh, I would also like um, to thank all the volunteer team that we have here. It's amazing to see how many people engaging uh, in the organization of this event. And finally, I would also like to thank our translation team over there and over all the rooms. Uh, it's such a hard job to translate. Right? Um, when we think about languages and how uh, one can convey an idea to uh, people who don't know exactly what your cultural background is, uh, it's so important to have people that can uh, build on this bridge. So thank you as well. Um, so for this presentation, uh, we are going to talk about, in Portuguese, what we called Pegabot, which is, um, in a bad translation, a bot buster or even a bot trapper, a bot pointer. Um, but also, I'm going to talk a little bit about what approaches we can have to deal with this issue that Tricia has pointed out, chasing truth, right? Um, so a few contextual points first. Um, in Brazil, only 70% of the population has access to internet. Um, almost all of the 70% access it through mobile phones. Um, and it's important that this access is unle unevenly distributed all over Brazil. Brazil is a continental country, right? It's huge. Um, and access in Brazil is mostly, access to internet in Brazil is mostly concentrated in the south and southeast regions of the country, which are the richest ones. So that is a huge problem if we uh, are trying to um, think about digital democracies, right? Um, another important point, and maybe it's one that it's quite a specific to our context in Brazil, it's the use of WhatsApp. Um, WhatsApp is uh, the most used social media network in the country. Um, 
what we have right now is about 120 million users of WhatsApp in Brazil. And it's really funny to see how the different uses of it are. Uh, people sell whatever they want through WhatsApp. I usually order food when I'm at work through WhatsApp. Um, but people also share a lot, a lot of information. Right? Uh, I receive many petitions to sign, or I get to know about campaigns that are going on, or I read the newspaper through links that people send me on WhatsApp. Um, so it's quite important to understand this context and understand how social media is used in our country. Um, Another contextual point is that when we're talking about social media um, and we're talking about new technologies being developed within this kind of structure, um, what we have is some sort of a factory uh, mechanism, right? Um, the possibility of creating fake profiles or creating bots or creating a whole s set of um, different mechanisms in that sense is something that um, has a very like um, approach or a approach, yes, to a production cycle, right? Um, so this article in New York Times is also really interesting because it talks a little bit about how this chain actually uh, is being updated and it's being used by people and by politicians as well to engage uh, in election cycles and to bring in more, um, more electors, for example, or followers, so to say. Um, in Brazil, that is happening right now. Um, we have presidential elections coming tomorrow, um, and we are going to be here, me and uh, my fellow Brazilian colleagues. Um, and on a side note, it is actually a pleasure to be here talking about this and thinking about what we can do also in the medium and long terms. Right? Because even though right now we are feeling the pressure of all this environment happening, it's also important that we think in the long term. So how are we going to tackle the problem of misinformation uh, on the long run after election, uh, electoral campaigns? And how are we going to deal with politics that uses uh, disinformation to manipulate and uh, manipulate debates and manipulate how people think? Right? Um, so this is happening in Brazil right now. What we have is presidential campaigns and many studies and many reports coming out that fake news is happening. Fake news is going on and presidential candidates have been using different mechanisms within this ecosystem to uh, attract more um, electors and also to uh, build in their uh, campaigns. Um, this is a report from the Getulio Vargas Foundation. Um, of it's a month old, almost. Uh, and in this report, what you can see, it's a graph. And we have different colors, almost each of them representing one uh, presidential candidate. And the black dots are bots. The black dots are the ones who are influencing the debate the most, as you can see. You can see a huge concentration of bots on that blue zone over there, which is um, from our most far-right extremist candidate, Jair Bolsonaro. And you can also see a lot of bots on that other um, point over there, on that other side over there, which is the red one, uh, which is um, bots working within the electoral, um, within the spectrum of uh, the Workers' Party candidate, Fernando Haddad. So that's a quite complex um, environment to navigate. Um, besides this, I'm, I just wanted to make one conceptual note. Um, when we think about misinformation, it's important that we kind of make a slight distinction between three different things. The first of them is misinformation per se, right? So misinformation is about false information or not detailed enough information or, well, I'm not going to talk 
much about this because there are other colleagues that are going to explore this much more, right? We can see a lot of categories within this umbrella called misinformation. Um, and of course, misinformation is about influencing some sort of debate. On a second uh, concept that we can think about is manipulation, right? So manipulation is the use of this kind of false information to generate dissent and polarization, right? So the idea is here is that we're actually influencing people's ideas through false information, right? So there is an idea of unbalance, right? And third, we can think about extremism. And extremism here, it's something that adds on to the layer of misinformation and manipulation. Because when we talk about extremism, we are talking about human rights violations. Um, so it's quite important to make this distinction, even though um, they're all completely intertwined, both as concepts, but also in practice. So, so seeing this context that we have in Brazil uh, and seeing a little bit about these concept that concepts that we have explored, um, we pose a question, right? How can we navigate social media within this context? Is it possible, right, to chase truth? Is it possible to not be completely influenced by all this negative um, points when we are living through uh, very, very hard times, talking about democracy and the maintenance of democratic systems. Well, it's possible to have different approaches. Um, the first of them is a unilateral approach, right, in which sometimes you have one actor just uh, saying what it is that we should all do. So here, for example, in Brazil, we have the case of the Supreme Electoral Court. They established a council to analyze misinformation or fake news cases. Um, and this court has already been on for four months. Um, but so far, what they've only made was mistakes. Uh, this case, for example, here, it's in Portuguese, but I'm going to talk to you about it. It's the case of one presidential candidate, Marina Silva, and uh, the court actually ruled to take down some content saying that it was misinformation, false information, but after a deeper analysis, they discovered it was not. Uh, so this approach has a lot of flaws, right? When you have only one actor and a top-down actor just deciding what to do about fake news or misinformation or manipulation, this is the result we get. A different approach, an approach we think it's much more interesting, it's a multi-stakeholder approach. So through this approach, what we have is different actors bringing their own expertise to tackle the problem of misinformation. Um, here I pointed out a few initiatives, but we have many of them in Brazil. One of them, um, it's called Lupa. And Lupa is the first fact-checking agency in Brazil. Uh, they have been doing work since the beginning of the whole fake news spread in Brazil. So that's really interesting. Um, after Lupa, there were many other initiatives, but two of them wh which are quite interesting are Comprova. Comprova is a network of newsrooms that works together to um, bust all these uh, misinformation cases that appear. So you can talk to them, you can send them a link, and then they're going to debunk it for you. Um, also, Fatma, uh, which is an abbreviation of fact machine. Uh, Fatma is a, a chatbot from also a fact-checking agency. And what they're doing is using a chatbot as well to debunk false news. Um, but this is the fact-checking approach, right? This is something that journalists do. But what about civil society and maybe um, activists? What, the, what can they do? So, for example, O Poder de Eleger, it's an initiative uh, that receives also links and images of, um, I mean, you can, you can talk to them on WhatsApp, and then they're going to also check that information for you and give it back. So the idea here is to use WhatsApp and to use broadcast lists to actually spread out what the real information is. 
And finally, uh, Sala da Democracia, or Democracy Room, uh, it's also an initiative from Getulio Vargas Foundation, which is um, also working with giving transparency to the environment of bots. Uh, so what they do is uh, a day-to-day -day analysis of how many bots there are, and they're working on specific topics. So how many bots are talking about public health issues? How many bots are talking about elections? How many bots are talking about public security? So in that sense, what they're doing is giving transparency to that environment. Well, so finally we get to the work we do at the Institute for Technology and Society. Um, at ITS, we believe that media literacy is the approach to go. And in that sense, what we do is we have different tactics to tackle misinformation. One of them uh, is through education per se, we could say. So we give online courses on fake news and elections or on different other topics that are all in this ecosystem or this environment, right, of how can we get better informed, how can we access information, how can we really make that um, something that is part of our everyday uh, everyday lives, right? Um, besides this, we also uh, think about advocacy as one of our tactics. Um, this photo here is one of our directors. Uh, he attended a public hearing on misinformation and extremism, and the idea was that in this public hearing, we had many, many actors from civil society, and also um, they were giving their ideas right to the court on how to better understand and how to better approach misinformation. Um, by doing this, what we are saying is we have a stand. And we, as civil society, as a think tank in Brazil, we cannot make, uh, we cannot have this un ongoing, right? Um, a third tactic is approaching the media. And when I say media here, it's quite complicated, but I mean the larger media, right? Uh, so TV and radio, which continue to be huge in Brazil. People um, watch TV a lot and people listen to the radio every morning on their cars, going to work, commuting. Um, so what we do is that we also explore these spaces in order to talk about fake news or to talk about misinformation. Uh, on these spaces, what we do is, again, a work of translation, right? So how can we properly talk to the broad public about things that might be too technical or too complicated for them to understand, right? How can I explain, and I always use this, this example, how do I explain to my mother what a bot is? So I always like to use that and think about those kind of spaces, right? So when we are talking on the TV, for example, I cannot just simply say, all the technicalities, I have to translate that content to the public. So that is a third tactic we do at ITS. Finally, and maybe this is the, the main object of this talk here, is a, th a fourth approach or a fourth tactic that we have when we talk about misinformation. And this is something we have been doing since the beginning of this year. Um, we launched Pegabot. So Pegabot is um, a tool, an online tool, which allows any of you to check if a Twitter profile is a bot or not. Um, Pegabot was developed uh, by using the algorithm developed by Indiana University. And what we did was first, again, a work of translation. Uh, Indiana University developed the algorithm in English, so we had we had it made read Portuguese in the first place, right? But not only language-wise, but context-wise. Uh, so Pegabot is a very simple tool to use, and I uh, recommend that you do it now during my talk. You can go online to pegabot.com.br, and I know it's in Portuguese, but it's so easy that you can understand, even in Portuguese. Um, you can get a Twitter handle, so you can get mine, for example, or your own, and check 
the percentage of how bot-like your activities are. Um, what is interesting is, well, first, I'm going to give you two examples here, which is good, because then you can uh, access your own profiles and check that for yourselves. Um, but first, over there, we have Jair Bolsonaro, which is, uh, as I said, one of the uh, presidential candidates and our far-wing extremist uh, candidate right now in Brazil. Uh, so if you check him on our Pegabot tool, you're going to see that he is 34% bot-like. Right. Let's see. Um, over there, you have a few uh, specific points talking about what bot-like actually means. So uh, the frequency in with which Jair Bolsonaro posts, uh, his emotions, so how personal are his posts, his tweets specifically. Um, his friendships over there, you can also check that as well, meaning uh, the other s uh, followers, right, or the other connections that he has online. Um, on the side, um, on this side, which is your right side, my left side, but your right side, um, you have Rosie. Uh, Rosie is a bot. Uh, it is a, a known bot, uh, which is an initiative from Operação Serenata de Amor. It's an initiative in Brazil. And Rosie, it's actually a bot that checks um, public uh, accounts. And, well, you can see there that Rosie is more than 50% bot, right? So you can actually see that her tweets and the way she behaves online is very bot-like. Um, something important is that for now, Pegabot is only checking Twitter, but soon we hope to also check Facebook profiles. Um, that will happen soon, I hope. But we have been dealing with the development of this tool uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we are really interested in making it uh, very uh, shared. And as I said, it's such an easy tool that it doesn't matter if you only speak Chinese, that you can use it. Um, something also interesting that we started to do with Pegabot and we aim to do it more and more, is to create some sort of news reports on bots, or a bot newsroom. So the idea here is that we're going to analyze specific profiles to tell stories, to create stories about how bots are acting, how bots are um, creating identities and narratives online. Uh, this case here is something that we did uh, in partnership with one of the hugest newspapers in Brazil, Estadão, or Estado de São Paulo. And here we analyze the profile of three uh, presidential candidates, um, minor ones, um, Flavio Rocha, João Moedo, and Álvaro Dias. And what we saw is a huge amount of bot activity on their profiles. So that is important because, again, as I said, our media literacy approach is a lot about giving transparency into what people are reading, into what people are consuming in terms of information. It's about them, right? It's about how you are going to consume that information and how you are going to deal with it. We are just giving a tool. Uh, so finally, as I said, the whole translation process is important for us. So uh, we've partnered with an organization in Mexico, which is Enjambre Digital, uh, and we created Atrapabot, which is the Spanish version of Pegabot. Uh, and we have the happiness and um, the honor to say to you that our code is open. Uh, we've just um, tweeted it a few hours ago in Brazil, it was already Friday, but here it's Saturday, um, that our code is open. So it means that any one of you who wants to go into our GitHub uh, repository and help us to make and bring Pegabot to Taiwan or to whenever, whatever country uh, you guys are working in, it will be a pleasure for us to, um, to share it with you. So thank you and xie xie.